Welcome to today's Greenleaf presentation from the Latin American and Iberian Institute at the University of New Mexico. Each year, the LAII partners with UNM University Libraries to offer Richard E. Greenleaf Visiting Library Scholar Awards to support scholars who work with these premier collections. Dr. Antonia Carcelen Estrada is one of the Greenleaf Visiting Scholars. Antonia is an activist, translator, and scholar of comparative literature, cultural race studies, oral history, and early modern and medieval studies. She has taught previously at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, the College of the Holy Cross, the Universidad San Francisco de Quito, and St. Sarah Lawrence College. Perhaps most importantly, Dr. Carcelen takes her scholarship and teaching outside the academy into Afro-Indigenous and Latinx communities. She has worked with Afro-Ecuadorian women to promote peaceful and equitable development in Esmeraldas. She has designed workshops and pedagogical materials for intercultural translation in the Amazon. She has trained young Afro-Ecuadorian women and members of the Amazonian Quijos Nation to collect oral histories and many other projects. As a Greenleaf scholar, Dr. Carcelen has carried out research in the Indian Affairs Collection of the UNM Center for Southwest Research and Special Collections Repository. We are so grateful to have her at UNM where she is working closely with the LAII. Today, she will share with us her research regarding the double colonization of the New Mexico Pueblos, a colonization worked by both Spanish and Anglo imperialism. Welcome, Dr. Antonia Carcelen Estrada. Thank you. That was a beautiful introduction. I am super humbled and grateful for the opportunity to collaborate with LAI. LAI has been indeed like a home to me, a home base, a very, very welcome home base too, because I found incredible resources, people, students. And um, today I am giving the results of the first part of my research, which is, as you said, the Indian collection. Affair, Indian Affair Collection, and it goes until 1905. Um, and it is particularly focused on the Pueblo, although it does have connection around it to Dakota and also um, Navajo history and Apache. So the first box of the Indian Affairs Collection contains documents that expo expose the legal arguments and illegal maneuvers that the Spanish, Mexican, and U.S. colonialism used to conduct their land theft, Pueblo dispossession in the name of God, progress, and civilization. The manuscripts in these collections connect indigeneity in Anglo and Spanish America, bridging the gap in a single case study Though the Pueblo are hardly alone in this phenomenon of a double colonial bind in New Mexico, where the most indigenous people in the entire United States reside. The story of this possession here perfectly illustrates how colonialism develops legal mechanisms for dispossession of land and waterways, with documentation that outlines genocidal logics for the expansion of lands possessed. A comparative analysis of Spanish and Commonwealth imperialism in the colonial double bind of the Pueblo nations from the viceroys of Mexico as Indians to the Kingdom of New Mexico to the genocidal advance of the United States from 1848 to 8, 1905 into the territory, as they call it, of New Mexico, will flesh out this overlapping history of an early Spanish colonialism and its reconfiguration after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. In the context of Wounded Knee, the Pueblo fight for land and water stands in intercultural dialogue with the Navajo and Dakota nations in the Corn Corridor, apparent in the examine and documentation examine. In the Land is Our History, Miranda Johnson explains the fraught relationship between the Commonwealth post-colonial states and First Nations. She condemns treaty-based relationships whereby sovereignty gets stolen through scraps of paper, resulting in a fragile truce, so that indigenous nations set their anti-colonial struggles using settler and international law. 
in the post-colonial Commonwealth from pre-Harold Cardinal's 1969 demand for treaty recognition through red power and the lawyer's vision of humanity to the Maori conceptualization of first peoples by using contract law and its oral interpretation, this state applied pluralistic policies to submit to settler law through constitutional revisions in Supreme Courts, leaving everywhere indigenous nations without land, water, and sovereignty, mere holders of powerless titles with which to confront mining incursions into their territories with all its colonial violence. For the Maori, the 1987 Supreme Court case defined them as, quote, partners, while indigeneity comes again to redefine the political game and join the global claim for self-determination. The Maori got collective property recognized as a constitutional right and also the recognition of an exclusive ownership to their land. Although the United States formerly in the Commonwealth has the British imprint of coloniality, it also uses French and Spanish colonial frameworks and lands to make renewed claims to the acquired territory on its way to its manifest destiny. For Brother Town scholar Kathleen Perez Brown, Spanish progress of assimilation and death, or quote, destroyed to replace, end quote, the doctrine of discovery, served as the basis for a United States program for forced assimilation and erasure from the land and history since 1787. The policies of this overlapping colonial machinery seeks to suppress rights, dispossess, and mine. While the British proclaimed in 1763 a prohibition to, to expand west of the Appalachian Mountains, the independent colonies had other plans for an expanding population. In his Johnson's versus Macintosh, the independent colonies had other um, the decision of 1823 in Supreme Court Justice John Marshall settled colonial land claims favoring grants over indigenous titles of the Ayan Kisho Indian nation, stating that, quote, the United States has the exclusive right to extinguish Indians' interest in their lands, either by purchase or just war, end quote. Marshall set a trilogy of cases to terminate nations, later using similar arguments in Cherokee versus Georgia in 1831 and Worcester versus Georgia in 1832. Brown Perez concludes that the consequent policies based on the doctrine of this discovery, quote, would be put forth to deal with the Indian problem, including removal, relocation, reservation, allotment, assimilation, termination, reorganization, and self-determination, end quote. The first American wave of this possession, 1787 to 1828, came with unilateral treaties to secure land for cattle ranchers and farming and ends with the Marshall decisions. On May 1830, Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act, IRA, inaugurating a period of relocation. He writes, quote, this immigration should be voluntary, for it would be as cruel, as unjust to compel the aborigines to abandon the graves of their fathers, end quote. At the end of forced relocation in 1887, the United States had 326 reservations that today encompass 56.2 million acres, 16 million of which are the Navajo land. After the reservation model was established, the period of allotment and assimilation began. That's 1887 to 1934. The reservation model was established and then the uh, Carlisle schools were designed as stated by its maker, Richard Henry Pratt, to quote, kill the Indian in him and save man, end quote. Although he wrote this in 1792 and established the schools in 1879, pardon, um, 1892, and the schools in 1879, allotment itself does not begin until 1887 with the passing of the General Allotment Act 
or the DOES Act that reassessed land tenure to give the, quote, excess land to white settlers. Henry Dawes, the proponent of allotment, believed in the, quote, civiliz civilizing power of private property, end quote, and successfully reduced indigenous land tenure from 150 million acres to less than 50. In 1924, all indigenous people were imposed U.S. citizenship. Most of the Pueblo documentation examined belongs to this period of allotment when Pueblo sovereignty was finally submitted to settler law. There are three language families in indigenous New Mexico, Sunni, sp spoken by the Sunni, Quereran, spoken by Laguna, Acoma, Santo Domingo, Cochiti, Santa Ana, San Felipe, and Sia Pueblo nations, and the Tenoan family of Iwa, spoken by Taos, Picuri, Sandia, and Isleta, Tegua, by Santa Clara, San Ildefonso, San Juan, Pojoaque, Tezuque, and Nambe Pueblos, and Towa, by Gemes. The Sunni and the Pueblos, descendants of the Anasazi, were the only peoples of ancient New Mexico. Then came nomadic refugees of French and Spanish colonialism, like the Navajo, Apache, and Comanche nations. The Pueblo developed irrigation canals, acequias, for the cultivation of squash, beans, corn. They wore buffalo hides, dried their meat, and used more than 70 edible and medicinal plants. By the 15th century, they were surrounded by Navajo and Athabasca and Apache nations. The Navajo in Tewa, Arroyo of Cultivated Fields, it's the name in Tewa of the word for Navajo. Um, they did cultivate corn, they weave basket and had shamanic rites that made them excel in sand painting, even better than the Pueblo and Navajo counter and um, Apache counterparts. The Pueblo had Kiva temples with murals and a more organized religion, police and infrastructure. So the Spanish were unsuccessful in their attempts to settle in New Mexico throughout the 16th century. First came Juan Ponce de Leon to Florida looking for quote, eternal youth, and he died instead in 1513 there. And in 1528, Anfilo de Narvaez followed his path on five boats with 400 men. Only 242 survived this incursion, reduced to 80 after a shipwreck and on the return of the two boats that remain. And of these 80 men, only 15 arrived alive when they entered Texas in the spring of 1529, immediately becoming captives. And among them were Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, the Black Moor Esteban, who had survived the previous uh, Florida uh, raid, and then two other Christians who escaped five, and all of them escaped five years after captivity, arriving to New Mexico Northern Frontier in 1534. The Viceroy Antonio de Mendoza heard of the myths of the seven cities of gold, he called it Cibola, and sent Fray Marcos de Niza, a veteran from Pizarro's expeditions in Peru, and Esteban, and Indian helpers, and Stephen went ahead a couple of days, leaving crosses of different sizes according to the importance of what he found ahead. And when Marcos found the large cross, he got excited, but only found him killed by the Sunnis at Hawiku. Though the Black Mexican remains in the legend of the land of the everlasting summer. Marcos imposed his myth of Cibola over Hawico, motivated to find the Golden City before Fernando de Soto or Hernando de Cortes. So he tries again in 1540 with Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, who enters with 250 men uh, in horse and 50 more on foot, their families and again, Indian helpers. Um, hold on, let me just... Most of these expedition died, some survived, and um, found themselves at the border of the Colorado River and were the first settlers to see the Grand Canyon, but they were forced to retreat. 
Well, Coronado ventured into the canyon. Garcia Lopez de Cárdenas with Bigotes, or his interpreter, a native of Pecos, they settled in Tigre, but immediately met resistance. A pony slave known as El Turco because he looked like an Ottoman told Cárdenas of the golden city in Quivira, from the Wichita Indians in Kansas, a pueblo pot, plot to get rid of the settlers. The Duke settlers went in vain and Coronado returned and found them and he was enraged and committed the massacre um, in Tigres of 1542. The Turk died, tormented by the carrots, it's a torture system of the Spanish, and Coronado declared in a letter that his land was, quote, unfit for Spanish settlement, end quote. When he returned to New Mexico, he was demoted fine and sidelined for his massacre, and he died poor in 1556. Fray Agustin Rodriguez came from Santa Barbara through the Rio Grande, visiting all pueblos until he reached Taos in June of 1581. The priests in Agustin's mission were killed in Tigre, like the antecessors, left behind by Coronado, and killed in 1544. In 1590, again, Castaño de Sosa, comes with an entire village of Almaden with promises of silver mines and finds the Pecos River and settles in Santo Domingo, but is arrested in 1591 for settling without a grant. He died in exile in 1593. The final futile attempt was by Leiva, who gets duped again <laughs> at San Ildefonso, like his predecessors at Chigur, and goes to Quivira looking for the golden city where he gets killed. Spanish settler colonialism begins technically with a grant by King Philip II to Oñate in 1595, who lives from Santa Barbara with 400 men, 130 families, and a historian who penned the first official history of a land in what is today the United States, the epic poem, A History of New Mexico published in 1610. Oñate founded San Juan de los Caballeros on July 11, 1598. Then San Gabriel to move away from the San Juan Indians, a settlement upended by the Acoma attack on December of 1598. On January 3, 1599, Juan de Saldívar begins slewing Acoma Indians and by the 21st, the entire town was smoldering ash. When the reinforcement from New Mexico, New Spain arrived on December in 1600, they found San Gabriel deserted since all the settlers had left. Oñate resigned in 1607 and died poor soon after. New Spain declared New Mexico a colony in 1609 so that a governor, Pedro de Peralta, was sent in 1610. He moved the settlement from San Gabriel to Santa Fe, a settler town away from all the Pueblo villages. And the United States, oldest capital today. The following decades saw less of a settlement and more of a mission model with churches at the margins of towns asking for taxes and involving people in labor systems, which increasingly became incompatible with, with Pueblo laws. And uh, that unleashed the revolt of the Pueblos in 1680 because they were destroying the Kivas and becoming uh, more uh, violent against the Pueblo religion. So when Don Diego de Vargas Zapata Luján Ponce de Leon, that's his name. Don Diego de Vargas from now on to keep it simple. He came to avenge the revolt 12 years later. He was pressured with a French advance and open trade with Indian tribes and also an advance from the Indians of the Great Plains into the Pueblo and also the Spanish settlement. And that pressured um, for an advance. Vargas found abandoned pueblos and Santa Fe occupied. He evicted them the next day and then visited pueblos to the north, 
and to the West, convincing them all to let them settle so that he reconquered New Mexico without a single bullet and through a campaign that lasted for four months. Finally, in October 4th, 1693, he set north with 100 soldiers, 70 families, 18 friars, friendly Indians, they went from Indian helpers to friendly Indians in the language, and livestock. While the Sunni, Acoma, and San Ildefonso raided Santa Fe periodically and killed the mission priests. The first box in the Indian Affairs Collection begins the story of New Mexico with many documents penned by the same man, Diego de Vargas, and the men involved in his petition. The first document dates from March 18, 1695, and shows him in front of the Tanos and Teguas, who had settled on improved lands of San Lorenzo and San Cristobal, declaring that this was too much land for such few people, so that those from San Lazaro should go move to San Juan de los Caballeros at once, a town in the frontier with the Apache and Ute enemies and with gradually uh, giving them a grant to settle. He forbids them to plant in San Lazaro and gives them one month to vacate and settle in this town that was, quote, abandoned only a few years ago on account of them having gone to settle on the lands of the Spaniards, end quote. He gathered Indian governor, Cacique Don Cristobal Llope, and other Pueblo leaders in the plaza to quote, inform them of my order, end quote, and to bring 16 families and 150 people to San Lazaro. Because they had settled on Spanish land after the 1680 revolt, it was, quote, neither unjust nor tyrannical to order them to leave, end quote. For those in San Cristobal, they were to leave and settle at the end of the Cañada of Chimayo and were also given a grant to settle, and I quote, I will keep my word, end quote, so that he could establish their settlements and plant their crops. The document is co-signed by Secretary of War, Rafael Rael de Aguilar. The next document repeats that Yope was read the order by interpreter in his Thanos language, quote, word for word, end quote, and that they had agreed, he says, to obey and go to the end of the Cañada called Chimayo. The end is another, uh, the next is another letter from March 20, 1695, to the same Luis Granillo from the previous document, the Captain General of the Kingdom of New Mexico, to inform of the former Spanish settlement in Tezuque, now in ruins. The next day, they went to examine the land and determine what was enough land for irrigation. They sent Yope, the Thanos, and, quote, captive women who had escaped from Santa Fe, end quote, according to Luis Grandillo's quick reply. They made a list of properties naming the previous owners and restitution to the new settlers arriving. The petition of the Thanos of San Lazaro and San Cristobal begged for more time to be able to plant the wild lands and the governors of each town promised to go, quote, as soon as we take the crops, end quote. But the Thanos refused to go to San Juan and rather join those to San Cristobal. Vargas responds with a new settler town called Villanueva de la Santa Cruz de Españoles, claiming direct authority from the Spanish king and describes how settlers arrived to San Lazaro on June 1694 and lived with Nambe, Pojoaque, Acoma, San Ildefonso, Santa Clara, and San Juan de los Caballeros. The Viceroy Conde de Galve grants the settlers tools and cattle in 1695, while the pueblos must go to unfertile land with whatever they can carry. The second folder begins with a document by John Monroe, civil and military governor of New Mexico, and makes a detour to Dakota expropriation of their lands and waters under the hands of Commissioner Jones, denouncing the, quote, violation of the treaty obligations 
and of the United States to these Indians, end quote, and forcing the Standing Rock Indians to leave their lands for cattle, quote, desirable tracts among streams, end quote. So um, this is very sad <laughs> to read these documents. It's uh, all the elders of the CU, one after another, giving reasons as to why they have rights to the to the river, to the Missouri River. Um, and they uh, conclude saying that it's a fraud system and with a saying, the Indian never have calves, but the white man always gets twins. And so um, on the newspaper, Secretary Hitchcock declared that this land had been overrun by cattle for years and that the Indians will receive money they never even knew they were entitled to. They leased lands. Um, these leased lands came with missions and declared that these orders were not in conflict. They repeated this document after document after document. Uh, as a repeated sentence at the end of the document, and it is in no conflict with any previous treaty rights. They repeated that concept. The CEOs very clearly say that their tribe is not consenting and that they were, quote, not consulted in the matter at all, end quote, foreshadowing the language for indigenous, indigenous rights developed in the UN in the 20th century. In 1902, Commissioner Jones, the same one who was with the Dakota writes, how much land do the Indians need? Jones was in the Sandia Pueblo a year later in 1903. So there, the caciques of Isleta, Sandia, San Felipe, Santa Ana, Sia, Pochiti, ask if they have the right to criminal jurisdiction and do they have the right to punish those violating the rules they make. They emphasize that they have grants by the Spanish authorities and that the reservations are registered as corporations and thus have rights to private property. The district court, however, finds that they hardly need more land. When the Pueblo leaders reached Washington, D.C., they were told that there was no need to come to Washington and to wait for the final report or the Supreme Court decision. The Supreme Court was with Jones and the cattle ranchers and the railroad and the schools. The Acoma, for example, are forced to lease in 1886 and again in 1888, and the district court dismissed their complaints to secure cultivation instead of what he termed use, wasteful use of their land. They are also told that these lands have been occupied by the railroad company <laughs> for longer than that, and that it must be similarly be taken away for, quote, public purpose and for progress, end quote. They were also with the canals that took the uh, Sandia access to waterways like the Commissioner Jones had designed with the CU Nation. The documents in the court case of the Albuquerque Land and Irrigation Company um, fights as a corporation and proves that companies have more power than treaties. It also proves that corporations rule over the courts in New Mexico and California, as well as the Supreme Court in the United States. So I wanted to share with you today um, what I consider is two versions of the doctrine of discovery that get played out uh, on different moments and different places. It's also difficult, very difficult to keep track because throughout these very many waves of imperial expansion um, and destitution, right now we are again uh, living this uh, in the northwestern part of the state where there is a pipeline problem going on. And again, the pipeline, like in the Dakota just recently, in the same places, right? It, it's it, it's dispossession and it's 
periodical, it gets reinvented, it gets transformed, it goes into policies, it goes into politicians' discourses, it goes into Congress, and it is a blatant, genocidal land theft um, that takes away all kinds of sovereignty and dignity, and yet the the clarity, the genius, the uh, the uh, integrity of the indigenous voices in these documents, it's incredibly haunting, even though they are muffled and silenced at every turn. For example, uh, the Commissioner Jones papers and all these complaints eventually they say, oh, oops, you know, this paper, maybe they didn't reach you because they were stolen or something, and they, they killed this, the messenger, so maybe they didn't reach you. And then when you go into another folder, many folders later, there's many folders, you, you see that the conversations in LA where they are already planning everything before Commissioner Jones even existed in the Cota Seoul nations or the Pueblo nations, they were already saying, and the, the letter just says, what if we just take it? What if you just declare this as our private property? And they use the railroad to do that, even though the railroad was eminent domain. So um, that is what I wanted to share. I wanted to share how the policies and the structures of post-colonial nations are uh, in, indeed based on the doctrine of discovery, and it really overlaps nicely with the Spanish um, versions of um the doctrine of discovery and what they seem uh, it's necessary to take away for what they need mm -hmm. yeah in both cases there is the the, con the concerns are the same land and water and it's crazy that it's hundreds of years and we're still in the same company thank you thank you so much antonia um do people have questions? It looks like David has a question. If you can unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Actually, I was that was just I was just clapping, but I also had a, a question too come to mind. I guess just what are some of the key takeaways? Maybe some of the most pivotal moments that we should walk away with in in in, in this uh, presentation today, uh, in terms of a historical dates and events, I guess. I mean, first of all, that our version of history, it's totally bonkers. Like you go here and you go to the school and what's the name of the school? Coronado, right? And you're like, oh my God, Coronado, it must have been like the Pizarro of Peru or something, right? And then you see that the guy fucking gets killed. Like he, he gets nowhere. Like no one gets nowhere. And it's almost like, they get hunted. Like everyone who tries in the 16th century has a horrible ending. Like not only don't they succeed, but their life is done. Their politics is done. They go into exile, they die, they get killed. It doesn't go well. All the priests in the 16th century, all of them are killed. And also to see who are the people who are resisting the settlement the most, right? So to see, for example, the role Sunni play, so central. And we don't think of Sunni as being important in US history. And here you are, and you see that they are, um, not only are, are they part of US history, but they are protagonists, right? Um, and and we don't know these histories. It's it. No one tells us how things are. Um, now, the 17th century begins like a more official performance of settlement, right? Like they have more of a settlement language, but there are no settlements because all the settlements run away, right? <laughs> or they die, or like they, they're not successful, right? Like Coronado says, don't come here. This is hell. Go go away. Um, but what happens? The French are in Louisiana, right? And they are coming through the plains. And the French are causing a lot of trouble to the United States and to the British and to the Spanish. The French are, the French are a pain in the ass, right? So, and they start trading. And so they start bringing 
new power relations, but also because of the expanding colonialism, other people get displaced. And where are they gonna come? They're gonna also come to what the map of the presentation was, which is Indian country, right? Um, and, and something that this is a map at the end of the 19th century, and it is still conceived as Indian country, right? This is what the, the 19th century, not the end, but it's like a, a map midway to, to assess what they had gotten after the Guadalupe uh, 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 treaty, right? Guadalupe Hidalgo. And by the way, this is now, all these maps are being exhibited on the third floor in the library. And I totally encourage you to go see how these stories and these conceptions of the place, like, imagining that these are the cities of gold and there's no gold and there's no water and then they're fighting for water and you know and then they get kicked out of the streams also to think for example why do we eat burgers right like the violence the epistemic violence behind each of your burgers like we don't think about that we just consume cattle and we destroy the planet and we don't cons we don't think what what does cattle really mean? And it's so important. Like, who are the cowboys in our Western movies, right? Like, what are all these discourses? How is it that cattle ranchers can take over federal buildings with weapons and no one bats an eye? Like, all these are very long stories and very big structural constructions that maintain colonialism intact in our post-colonial societies, right? Um, and it affects how we relate to the space. It also affects nature. It affects water. It affects pollution. Of course, the Dakota were complaining. And guess what? Bob, there was a pipe breakage, right? So it's like, yeah, no shit, dummy. And they always come like, no, it's because you don't understand. We have science. You just haven't seen the science. This is super ecological mining. What the hell? There's no ecological mining. That doesn't make any sense. What are you talking about? And where is the mining? Always on indigenous land, right? So it is something that gets repeated and repeated, but there is no settlement. And then the way that the settlement is presented to you, it's shaped to you. As, and then comes Diego de Vargas, and then he reconquests. That's the language that they use. Reconquest New Mexico as if they had ever conquered it. No settlement was successful, and yet they are now reconquering it at the end of the 17th century. And these are the documents that are the first documents that the United States decides are worth translating to base their claims over Indian nation. You see what I mean? So they are translating. If what I'm reading in these documents, it's not even the original document. It is a translation commissioned by the Indian Affairs in the Mexican archives that tell the story from the Spanish point of view of this possession of New Mexico, right? And so that's why you get all these fantasies of the seven cities of gold and of Cibola. And, and then you get things like Sigala, in Pecos claiming that, you know, and all these golden cities. And then the, you also get this repetition of the tricks, like people are crazy for gold. So you keep on telling them, oh yeah, go that way. That's where the golden city uh, is. And it's bullshit. They know it's bullshit. They just want them off themselves. Mm -hmm. Catherine? Have you ever thought about the, Something I've been trying to figure out, and I, I wonder, since you've worked with Afro and um, indigenous communities in Ecuador, this relationship of, and I'm thinking of Esteban Ico or Esteban right now, you have Esteban, who today is seen as African-Americans by African-Americans in New Mexico as an important historical presence of Africa in New Mexico, and you see Zuni Pueblo looking at Esteban as the first white man in New Mexico. How well, do you it, how do you address that where you have an enslaved man who brings an incredible intercultural knowledge 
and is instrumental with his uh, in with his, uh, his geography. Expertise. He's the geographer, right? So you have him, and you have Zuni still seeing him as the man because who because he's the enemy, exactly. So he's the enemy. So today in 2023. How do you look at the, that that double and contradictory representation, and what do you do with it? Right, and so if the if the pueblo have a double colonial mind, Esteban has many more, right? Because in the way that they describe him in the archive, he is described as a slave always. No one though they mention he's a freaking genius leading all the expeditions because he is the geographer. He is the one who has explored the lands, well, and he's find the out the marks. He's not just the geographer, he's the diplomat. Well, he's everything. He, he knows the languages. He, I mean, imagine him. All right, so the story of Esteban. Esteban is insane because, yes, everyone agrees he's a slave. So he must have been... In Pomfilo de Narvaez's expedition, totally against his will. <laughs> Let's start with saying with that, right? So he's just found himself upon this situation where everyone dies. He survives. He goes through the Everglades into Texas and then goes through Texas pretending to be a healer, right? So he's like dressed up, but... He's not duping anyone. Everyone knows he's a Spaniard, even if he's black. In the minds of indigenous people, he's one of them. They don't see race. They see a Spanish person, which in any uh, indigenous race relation analysis is what? <laughs> so do you just look at these two representations and say they have to be antagonistic because well, they're all ideological all representations are ideological this happened also in the 12th century with the queen right so she's described she's the wife of one of these alphonse kings and she's described in the earlier documents as super white and blue eye and totally like freaking gorgeous and then 150 years later she shows up in castilian romance poetry and she's totally dark and she's ugly and she's evil and you know what I mean and in the architecture in her lifetime the enemy that was this other queen that hated her son because it was her opposition she described her in her building also as black even though the documents clearly state that she's white not only is she white she's descendant from Aragonese uh, women who were captured and so race everywhere is absolutely uh, relational and arbitrary, right? And so Esteban runs away. He's got to be very smart. He has to have known the ways of, of weeds to get this far and traverse all of Texas. But then he doesn't get to, he gets to the border of New Mexico and then he goes south. And then the next expedition is like, you know something, you're coming with us. Also, I'm not sure how willingly or freely he, because he doesn't speak ever, not in these archives. He doesn't have a beep of a voice, right? But you know that he's there and you know that he's killed and that he's killed and that he is being sent to be killed, right? Like you're sending him ahead, why? Why don't you all go together? You're sacrificing him. You know he's going to die, right? So it's no innocent. It's not innocent that, that they send him. And why do they send him? Because black lives don't matter. In the eyes of the conquistadors, who are the enslavers who call him slave, even though he ran away and should be free. You know what I mean? I don't know. Anyways, so... Um, in the Spanish system, he can only operate as black. And he is black, and in the 16th century, that becomes a thing that didn't necessarily have to be before, although it is becoming since the 12th. But by the 16th century, it is a must that if you're Muslim, you're black. 
And if you are a slave and you're black, it's because you're Muslim, right? So it becomes a one and all thing. And so they make this reference very obvious, a black moor, a black moor, right? Like as opposed to a white moor, which is the Turk, the Ottomans, that here out of total place appear in the in the Indian the Turco. Right. And this is another thing that is fascinating about indigenous history. And it is how these faraway fantasies with Islam and with Judaism come to totally define relationships and their meanings in these new lands when they're like, what the hell? Like, we are not part of the system. And it's like, nope. Well, now you're an Indian. Now you are, you know, like, and then, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Also, Another thing that I think it's important with the Steva is that his name is also replicated in other hybrid figures in the history of early colonial America. So I wonder if that was like Estebanillo, right? In the Caribbean, Estebanillo also raises up. And, uh, and, and Estebanillo does get to say a word or two, actually, he speaks a lot. Um, and he's one of those interpreters that gets his voice in the archives, because a lot of interpreters don't get a voice. They're totally silent and, and, and put away, right? And so Esteban, he, he speaks the languages, he has connections, he has the social capital, he knows some people here and there, and he definitely goes through. But at the end of the day, the Sunni are, they are smart. The Sunni know that it is nobody. And they know that Esteban is white, absolutely white. They couldn't care less about Islam, right? Uh, they kill him. Thank you. Um, other questions or comments or curiosities? <laughs> There's so many, like I didn't get into the railroad file but that is also a very sad file, right? That's the one that ends with the people in LA like having breakfast and all fat and jolly and enjoying of all the luxury of the country. And, um, and they already have planned on how to take all of the CU land and all of the Pueblo land. And, it, and so the, the people desperately going to court and making all these arguments and bringing all these papers and it's all a waste of time. A settler law is always gonna win. So we have about five minutes left. Is there something you'd like to share about what, whether you found something different in these archives from other archives and other histories that you've looked at with in terms of colonial settlerism and, and indigenous history? <laughs> well, this is frontier, frontier, right? So no one wants to be here, <laughs> but they keep on settling it. So that is like super ironic because for example, when you go into the, I don't know, the colonial archives of Esmeraldas, everyone is like, uh, I know it is terrible, and I will mention that in a second. Um, yes, it is terrible because yes, it is different. So okay, let me finish with the Esmeraldas. The Esmeraldas archives, they always talk about this bountiful world and this great place, and they also never get to settle. So in that they are similar to the Pueblo. It's also a frontier that never gets settled really until it's post-colonial. So and then for, you, those, for those who don't know, Esmeraldas is the coast of Ecuador, and there is both indigenous and black um, settlement there. Mm -hmm. But the Quito masculinity is dependent on this desire to go achieve this colonial session of Esmeraldas and achieve this access to the sea and not have to go to Peru, right? And get independent, if you wish, or more independent. Right, they don't want to give so many tariffs to Peru and all that. Anyways, so in that they are similar. Um, the Esmeraldas documents don't mention women ever. It's like as if they are assumed 
only matter the men who are causing the revolt and we're only going to talk about the men and we're like there's no mention there's no detail of the colonial violence like we have in the in the in the pueblos because the pueblos by the time that we get to these archives they are writing their story they're, they're, Yes, sure. The Supreme Court jackass, they're not going to hear their case, whatever. But they are still going to make their case. You see what I mean? And the language that the, that the Dakota use in that document, it's a long, long document. And it goes so in-depth. And that document should be a treaty of international indigenous law. It's It, it, it has most of the ideas that we have had and so many more. In, and everything is in the defense of the water and the land and life, right? Where is that document located? It is in the second folder. It is so really? random. Here. Oh, it's here in the Pueblos. It's in the Sandia folder. In the Sandia folder. Because of Commissioner Jones. Because he goes and tests out after Wounded Knee. How are you going to fight back after such a horrible massacre? Right? Like, with what strength can you fight back after that? And these are super defeated leaders. And all of it, that, with everything taken away, everything, they argue with such clarity. And they're like, well, you know, it, it's a no-brainer. Like, this is our land, this is our water, this is life, right? Like, but, um, and they say, you have no right because there was no consultation and there was no consent. And it's incredible that they are saying that because those are the two things that today we have in international law, that if you want to do a mining product, project, you cannot unless you have those two things, yeah. right? informed consent. And they are saying this in 1893. And this Jones goes from there and then uses everything already. And, and then he signs the document, your friend for the Sandia. When I see this signature, I'm like, why is there a Cota file here? I don't understand, right? I'm as confused as you. And then I see at the end of this letter, your friend, Commissioner Jones. I'm like, ah, he's not your friend, Jones. Right? <laughs> but just the, the perversity in the coloniality too, right? Like, how they know it's all fake, how they play with them, how it just, okay. And what the comment on the chat said, which I think it's so important, right? It says, it's so terrible to understand this. Imagine reading this at the same time as the Palestinian genocide that's played out. Mm -hmm. And so you get to see something in the archive and then get to see something live and get to see how it's futile to fight it. Like, and yet you still have to do it, you know? And that is a very, very strong contradiction in my research and in my being. Like, there are very serious consequences to doing this research and it's super traumatizing for sure. And it's difficult, very difficult to go to the archive and open the next file um, and not know what you're gonna find. And, and and whose massacre you're gonna read about and and to know that those dead in the archives, all those hunting souls like the ones in Palestine it still don't matter because at the end of the day it's a post-colonial project and a frontier development and there's nothing you can do, you know, the frontier must go and and democracy must win and that's it. Um and it is it is very painful. It is so painful, but it is also amazing to know that I live in New Mexico and I get to read these archives and I get to go out and I get to breathe in air that I know the Pueblo are still breathing, right? I love that the Pueblo ruled this land and sure, they might have lost sovereignty, whatever, but the substrate culture of New Mexico continues to be Pueblo in these lands at least where we are and that is absolutely felt um the navajo will be navajo right the sunni will be sunni and it is 
nice to go through this and, and understand those nuances because coloniality dumps a bunch of people under a term, like the pueblos are millions of nations, they don't even speak the same language, right? Um, and, and then also see how many of these pueblos get re-articulated, they abandon some settlements, they have to move, they have to, you know, and, and in terms of numbers too, just like the millions of hectares, the number of Pueblo nations also get reduced from Spanish to the end of, of US colonialism. Now we have 19 Pueblos. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, you for, guys. Thank you for bringing this archive to life in a way that as Nair Otano says, is both accessible and understandable and terrible. And let I want to go back to your words saying there's nothing to do and you have to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. So I invite everyone who came to go to the archives to learn and to go out and do the right thing. And unlike other archives, these ones you can read because they are early 20th century mechanography papers. Well, there's some letters that are difficult, but for the most part, they are the translations, they're official documents by a very modern Indian, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So it's very accessible. It's not like other archives that I make my students read that you need to know paleography. You don't need to know paleography to access these archives and they're all digitalized. So I totally welcome you to check them out. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us here on the Zoom conference.